Alrighty, well, thank you everyone for, for joining today. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm personally very excited to kick off today's webinar, uh, Best Practices for Google Business Profile Part 2. So my name is Trent Rufflow. I'm on the product marketing team here at Yext. And of course, before jumping in, we wanted to make a note for everyone here to sign up to uh, become a hitchhiker on our community site if you haven't already done so. Um, by doing so, you'll gain access to exclusive con content that's uh, very similar to this webinar here. Um, speaking on today's webinar, we have Calvin Castellino, our product manager. So um, he drives the direction of our product roadmap, uh, determines what listings features to build, and also serves as the technical expert um, and knows sort of the ins and outs of our listings product. Um, as I said before, we uh, have a lot of great content to cover here first um, to the agenda. There we go. What's new with Google um, as well as what's coming soon. Um, we know Google is always making changes, whether those are changes related to new features or updates to their API. Uh, we, of course, know how difficult it can be for you to stay on top of all those updates. So we want to just first make sure that you're aware of all the most recent changes, how you can take advantage of those, and of course, how they can impact your business. Uh, next, we're going to share some tips and tricks around user access groups, uh, user access and location groups. And then lastly, we're going to dive a bit deeper into Google's more complex fields. Um, this will include topics around the URLs that get displayed on your Google listings, you know, things that you can and can't control, um, as well as best practices there. Um, we'll discuss some topics around service area businesses and uh, in addition to um, differences between business descriptions and editorial summaries. So, of course, we'll save some time at the end uh, to answer any questions that you all might have. As a reminder, if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, please go ahead and just throw those into the chat there and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can um, when we get to the end of the webinar. So um, with that, I think that's enough of me talking and I will go ahead and pass it over to Calvin to just jump right in with what's new at Google. Great, thanks Trent. So let's start off with what is new with Google and what is coming soon with Google. Uh, so the first one here is about virtual restaurant brands. So uh, a virtual restaurant brand is basically uh, you can order food from it, um, but it doesn't necessarily have a storefront. Uh, so this could be, you know, one brand operating out of the kitchen of another restaurant. Uh, it'll have its own branding, its own menu, um, but it won't have a, a full restaurant uh, like a traditional restaurant. And so historically, uh, these were pretty uh, difficult to put on maps. Um, in fact, you see these three models below. Um, these were not actually allowed. Uh, you, you couldn't do every single one of these uh, up until very recently. Um, and so the different models here, uh, the first one here is delivery only. Um, so this would be, let's say you have a traditional restaurant, um, they have a brand, uh, but then they also have a shared kitchen space um, where there's a virtual brand operating out of that kitchen. Now they might not have tables uh, or waiters and waitresses the same way, um, but you can still order food from them uh, and they will deliver it uh, to your home. Uh, the next is more of a, a pickup model or a pickup and delivery model. Um, so they might support delivery just the same, um, but in this case, uh, they'll also have some sort of signage and maybe a little window um, or a part of a counter uh, where you can go pick up from that brand. Um, so you can do both the, the delivery piece uh, and the pickup piece and then support those. And then finally, uh, there's another model where um, there's a building that hosts a bunch of multiple brands or multiple, multiple virtual brands. Uh, so these again are not necessarily restaurants, they're just a building full of kitchens, um, all having their own branding. Uh, and you can now list these on maps as well. And so just to review what changed, um, Google updated their policy about virtual brands. Uh, there's clear guidelines now, and you can now uh, support all three of those models uh, on search and maps. Um, and so if you wanna learn more about this, uh, we have a great blog post uh, on Hitchhikers. So we have that link below, we can make sure we share it. Um, and in terms of impact, um, this allows you to have those listings out there. So um, for those virtual kitchen brands, uh, you can drive impressions and clicks uh, and really have them show up in search. Uh, and so we frequently work with uh, the MAPS policy team uh, to help them adjust policies over time. This is a great example of one we were able to help uh, get for our customers. Uh, the next one here, this is less of a Google change and more of a Yext change, uh, has to do with reviews. So this was part of our spring release. Um, so how review monitoring works with Google uh, is basically we rely on two different systems. Uh, so the first system uh, is webhooks. And so how this works is uh, once Google uh, receives a new review, they will let us know uh, via a webhook uh, in real time that that 
review now exists, so we can ingest it into our system. Now, webhooks are a bit finicky. Uh, they fail sometimes, they, they fail to fire sometimes. And so we have a, a backup scan where basically we will fetch all the review content uh, on a cadence, just in case that webhook failed and wasn't able to send us that review. And so previously this was done on a weekly cadence. Um, so we would basically have those weekly scans running at all times. Uh, we up this to a daily cadence. So now uh, if a webhook fails uh, to fire, uh, at worst, um, you, would, you would see that review within that 24 hour window. Um, so this helps you get uh, your reviews into our system as fast as possible. So you're engaging with those customers, uh, responding and, and seeing those trends. Uh, now let's move on to the coming soon content. Uh, so this is content that uh, is coming soon on Google and we will be able to support very soon. Um, the first are our place actions. Um, so these uh, basically are links uh, for, for pickup and delivery um, that appear behind this uh, blue order online button. So if you look at this uh, knowledge card here for a restaurant, um, you may have seen this button uh, out, out in the world just as you're ordering food. If you click order online, uh, it will take you to uh, food.google.com. Um, and in here, you basically have uh, a bunch of different links. There's the third party links. So this could be Grubhub or Postmates or Seamless. Uh, but then there's also those first party links. So if you see at the bottom here, there's this walkout.io. That's actually the, the business's own website um, where you can order food from. And so we're able to power that last link there, that one for, for first party. Uh, so that level will come soon. I'm talking a bit more uh, about place actions. So we'll be able to sync these soon. Um, and, and the benefits of doing this, there's a few different things. Uh, so one, um, if you didn't have that order online button already, so basically you had no links out there, um, if you sync a place action, uh, that blue button will appear. So just a reminder what that looks like, that order online button uh, can now actually uh, be controlled and, and be turned on, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, next is uh, if you do provide these URLs, um, so basically indicating that uh, you support pickup and or delivery. Um, it can improve your rank in search. Uh, so if, if Google knows more about your business, uh, they can surface you for, for more queries. Um, so that will basically uh, allow you to, to up your rank in search uh, by providing these. Um, and then the last piece here, um, if you actually specify so for a place action, so if it's pickup versus delivery, um, if you notice in this example here, there's this little gray, you know, may offer pickup piece down here uh, on, under this URL. And so this causes hesitancy with customers because Google doesn't know for sure if this business supports uh, pickup or delivery or both. Um, if you specify a place action, you're actually saying this is a pickup link or this is a delivery link. Um, and Google will remove that uh, may offer pickup tag there. Um, which just reduces that, that friction or hesitancy from consumers. Um, so that's another great uh, reason to provide these as well. Um, so that's place actions, uh, one of the great uh, coming soon features. Um, the other coming soon feature I wanna talk about is call history. So historically, um, we're able to get uh, a number from Google. It's basically clicks to call. So how many times someone clicked that call button on your listing, uh, you can just see the total sum of calls to your business over time. Um, but with the call history feature, we can actually take that a step further. And so um, the, the functionality here is first, businesses will be able to toggle on or off call history. Um, it's by default off, um, but if you do toggle it on, um, Google will begin to track uh, ca for calls made to your business through the Google Knowledge Card. Um, did the business actually pick up or not? Um, so you can see there's a breakdown here uh, of answered versus missed calls. And you can even see this breakdown you know, by the time of day. Um, so you can, you can see sort of trends and then how many calls you're receiving. Uh, and you can even look and see which locations you know, might be answering or not answering uh, during certain times of the day. Uh, so this gives you more business insight uh, to see how your actual locations uh, and the staff there are interacting with, with customers. So if picking up the phone is important to you, this is a great way to see uh, if that is actually happening. All right, so that covers the, the coming soon and what's new with Google. Um, now let's move on uh, to some tips and tricks here. Um, so to start, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, user access and location groups. So this is a bit of a, an abstract concept uh, in, in Google Business Profile and the Google Sphere um, that people have questions on all the time. So hopefully we can demystify this a bit 
uh, and, and, and show you how this works. So um, there's a few different levels uh, of objects on the Google side. So um, there's an organization account. Um, and if you don't have an organization account, don't worry. Um, this still applies to a, a regular account as well. We'll, we'll just skip that first step. Um, but within that organization account, uh, there are what are called location groups or business groups. Um, you can think of these as folders of locations. And then there's also the locations themselves. Um, and you can see how each object is contained within the higher ones. So for example, locations go into location groups and then location groups go into accounts. Um, you can actually provision user access uh, to any of these three levels. And so if you have someone that has a Gmail account and they need to be working on specific locations or, or managing things within the account, uh, you can add them as you know, an owner or a manager um, of the organization account itself that will give them access to everything. So they'll get access to location groups and to locations and, and everything you could possibly see here. Uh, or you can give them access to just one or more location groups. So if you want them to have access to this green group here, but not the purple group, um, you would give them access to that. Uh, and then finally, um, you can actually give uh, users access to individual locations. So if you only want them to see the location on 123 Main Street and manage that, uh, you can do that as well. So it's really flexible in terms of how you provision. Um, so you maybe have, you know, more of higher level corporate users at the top level, you know, maybe a brand manager for a given brand's location group, and then maybe an individual franchisee at the location level. So any sort of use case uh, is possible here. And just to show you what this looks like, in Google's UI. Um, so this is actually a Yext organization account. You can see we have a you know, ton of users in here uh, managing things. Um, and this is basically where you'd see uh, the different owners and, and members of the org. Uh, and again, they, they would have access to uh, all of the objects uh, within the account. Um, next, we'll show you uh, what, a, what a business group looks like. So if you click on that manage business group button, you'll be taken to the settings for that. Um, and you can see the, the different managers that have access uh, to this specific business group. And again, all the locations inside of it. And then finally, um, on an individual location, uh, you can have different uh, owners and managers uh, that, are, that are managing the different pieces of that location. So again, they only have access to one location within the whole account, uh, not to the whole thing. Now, why is user access uh, important on Google? So not only is it flexible, but um, th there's actually some things to look out for here. And so uh, one thing I want to talk about here is the site manager role. So there historically were three different levels uh, of access on Google. Uh, there was the owner level, um, which basically gives you, you know, full access to the entire location. Uh, there was the manager level, which gave you limited access, uh, but you could still change some key fields. And then finally, uh, the site manager level, which was sort of like the lowest level. Um, previously, site managers could only update a few fields, uh, so it's very limited in the access they had. Um, but what Google did at the end of last year is they actually removed the site manager role and they promoted all existing site managers to become managers. So now you either have owners or managers and that's it. There's, there's no other roles in between. Now, this, this is you know, positive for a few reasons. So one, now, you know, if you have people out in the field that have this access, they can now do more with the listing. Uh, they can update more content. Uh, you know, they can accept suggestions. Uh, they can respond to reviews. It's a great way to engage, uh, you know, at the, at the field level, um, at the local level with, with people on maps. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you don't want someone to manage a listing for whatever reason, uh, they now actually have a little bit more control. Uh, now, luckily, there's a great way around this. Uh, if you are the owner of a listing, at any time, you can always remove access of whomever you want. Uh, you can actually see who has access, both within Google and in the X platform. Uh, and then on Google itself, you can actually remove users whenever you want to. Um, so you might ask, well, how does a user get there if, if I didn't add them? Well, um, anyone could actually get access to a listing if they're able to verify they're a business owner. So for example, if I'm a store manager, I send myself a postcard and I receive that postcard and, and, and put the code in, um, I technically can become a manager on that listing. Uh, this is what Google wants because they want that local content, that local engagement. Um, but if you're more of uh, a model where you want that tight corporate control, um, you can actually remove users from those listings uh, and make sure that uh, only you are managing that content. 
Um, so hopefully this, this demystifies a bit um, on the different user access on Google. Um, we get a ton of questions on this. It's a very uh, complicated system. Um, next piece here uh, is about relocations and rebrands. Um, this is another one we had a, a great blog post on recently. Um, we get questions all the time, uh, you know, something like, I'm relocating, uh, you know, what do I do with my listing? Or I'm rebranding, you know, should I make a new listing or should I use my existing listing? Um, the answer is, it, it depends. Um, you really have two options here. So option one uh, is, is the simplest, it's just to update your existing listings. So in the case of a relocation, it'd be updating your address. Uh, in the case of a rebrand, you know, it'd be updating maybe the name, the phone number. Um, that works just fine. Um, the other option is to actually create a new listing entirely uh, and mark the old one as closed. Um, so that's also an option. Now, there's a few things to think about here uh, when you're deciding between those two options. So first would be uh, the distance that your business is actually moving uh, in the case of relocation. So if you're just moving across the street, you know, or to a different floor in a building, uh, it's very safe just to update your address on your location and be done with it. Um, but if you're actually moving pretty far away, so let's say to a different town or even a different state, um, you might have your business listing be uh, re-verified. So you have to, you have to re-verify it for it to go live. Um, in that case, you know the, the you have to do the verification step anyways. So uh, closing your listing and opening up a new one um, is is equal work. So you can kind of choose between uh, which one you want to do now. Why would you do one or the other? Well, another thing to think about uh, are the reviews uh, and the UGC on the listing. So let's say that uh, the reviews and the photos on your listing are no longer relevant. So it was for you know an old business under you know old ownership. Maybe those reviews weren't so great because they were talking about the, the previous owners and you want to start fresh. Um, if you want to do that, creating a new listing is a great way to sort of reset your review content and you know, start, start from zero. Um, but you know, if the, if the reviews for the last business were good and still pertinent to your business, um, then you consider just keeping that listing and updating the content um, if, if they are still relevant. And then finally, you gotta think about the customer experience here. Um, so if, if, if a listing just magically updates one day to be a totally new brand, um, that could be a bit jarring for users. Um, so one nice thing about making that new listing is you can mark the old one as permanently closed uh, so if users search that old listing, they'll still find it on maps, they'll see it's permanently closed, they'll see your new listing, and they'll go to that one. Um, so again, you have options here between these two steps. Um, you know, take a look at that blog post and that will help you decide uh, which one is the best for you. Um, next here, I want to talk a bit about how Google determines uh, local ranking. Um, so this is from uh, the, a support article on Google. Um, they reference three main pieces here. So there's distance. Uh, there's relevance uh, and there's prominence. Um, so starting with distance, let's talk about what this actually means. Um, so if you search, for example, we'll use this one on the side here, uh, coffee near me. Um, if you are standing in the middle of Manhattan um, and you know the, if you're, a business listing for something in Chicago would never show up, the distance is just too far. Um, so making sure that you have that accurate address, that accurate geotag um, is very important here. Um, for, for making sure that you, you can you know, show up for those near me searches. So that's, that's one piece that Google uses to qualify uh, potential search results. Um, the next one here is relevance. So if I search for uh, you know, coffee near me, I don't wanna see a hardware store show up. I wanna see coffee shops. Um, Google does this, you know, a, a, the primary way is through the, the primary category. So coffee shop, for example, it's, it's pretty clear to show those for a, a search about coffee. Um, but they can also do this in more clever ways. They can do this uh, through attributes. So if I search for, you know, coffee near me with a wheelchair accessible entrance, um, if I don't have that wheelchair accessible attribute filled out, um, I might not, uh, you know, rank as highly um, and I, I'm not relevant for that query. So making sure that you fill out those attributes is also great. Um, but then also, you know, things like reviews and Q&A uh, can be indexed for search. So if someone searches for, you know, really good coffee near me or a certain type of coffee, um, if that uh, item appears on your menu or was mentioned in reviews or was mentioned in Q&A, um, now that, that Google has a signal that you have that item uh, and is a bit more relevant to that search. Um, so that's more of a uh, indirect way of, of, of improving your, your piece in search is having those, that, those good review content uh, that mentions specific items. Um, and finally is prominence. 
Um, so this is a lot of reviews and UGC and engagement. Um, so again, if you have you know, a high star rating, you have lots of recent reviews, um, this is a great way to improve your prominence. Uh, so Google knows to, to show certain things. Now, how do you take this information and how do you improve your, your local ranking? Well, um, Google's advice is this, uh, enter complete data. So you know, make sure that your profile is fully filled out. Um, there's actually an article this morning about Google toying around with sort of a profile completion uh, score. So you might see that appear on search for your business. Um, if it's not 100%, you know, go figure out what you're missing. Are you missing attributes? Are you missing menus? Um, are you missing holiday hours? Make sure all those fields are always filled out um, so Google knows and has the best information to, to surface you. Um, make sure your locations are verified. Um, this is hopefully done at this point, but if it's not, you know, get those postcards sent. Um, you know, get the, get the phone call, get the email, uh, make sure you get those codes and, and get uh, your businesses fully verified on maps. Um, next is keep your hours accurate. Uh, Google is very big on accurate hours right now. Um, so ensuring that you have, you know, accurate hours data always, you have holiday hours uh, is a great signal to Google that your business is open, you know, and ready to receive customers. Um, and then, you know, engage with your listings and, and, you know, think about that UGC, so like photos. So, you know, make sure you're responding to reviews, you're answering questions, you're posting photos. Um, all those show that you have an active listing uh, and it's one more signal to Google um, that you are active and, and ready for business. All right, next here, we're gonna talk about uh, some more complex Google fields. Uh, we'll go through some details there um, and, and we'll learn a bit about this. So the first one here is uh, URLs in a knowledge card. Um, as you can see from this example, there are a ton of them. Uh, I was able to actually find an example that had basically every URL type you can imagine. Um, you can see there's, there's five different clickable links on this single knowledge card uh, that all are powered in different ways. So uh, I'm gonna break this down for you so you guys understand you know, where all the stuff comes from. So the first one here uh, is the website URL. So that first button uh, on the top left, um, this is just your base website URL, um, you know, the, the, the local page for this business. Um, this can be directly managed, you know, through X to Google Business Profile. Uh, it's just the core website field. So this one's pretty easy. You want to make sure you have this filled out uh, for our, all your locations. Um, next, we have these two blue buttons. So these actually come from different places. So the first one, uh, if for reservations, and again, it doesn't have to be food. It could be other types of reservations. Uh, this is powered through uh, an experience called Reserve with Google. And so there are uh, third-party booking platforms that have integrated with this. Um, so if you're looking for uh, someone to set this up, there, there's a great list on, on Google's website um, that explains this. Um, but basically, if you click that reserve a, you know, with Google button, um, it's expected that you have a booking provider that is feeding Google data in real time you know, about how many you know, tables you have or appointment slots you have, if it's more of a doctor's office use case. Um, but that's the best way to get uh, that button on Google is, is using that experience. Um, then there's the order online piece. So we talked a bit about this. This is a combination of those first party place actions that, that we reviewed earlier but then also those third-party links that Google might get directly from, you know, a DoorDash or an Uber Eats, for example. So this will take you to more of like a, a food with Google experience or an order flow. And then finally, there's these two links at the bottom um, in the knowledge card. So there's things like, you know, menu URL or, or service list URL, uh, but then also, you know, reservation URL or appointment URL. These are more of the, the unstructured types that, that don't belong in those blue button experiences. Uh, these can still be provided, you know, sort of the old-fashioned way to Google uh, through the Google Business Profile API, um, and those will appear in the knowledge card just the same. Um, so as you can see, there's lots of buttons to click here, uh, but providing that complete experience makes sure that, you know, if I'm a user and I'm trying to do any of these actions, I have all the possible places I can click. Next, we'll talk about service area businesses. Um, so service area businesses are a little bit special on Google. Um, and, and what a service area business is, is basically um, they will visit or deliver or do services um, at a list of, uh, of different places. Um, and so, you know, it could be, you know, I am a handyman and I will come to your house if it's in these zip codes, for example. Um, service area businesses can also optionally omit their address. Um, so, you know, if, let's say this handyman, you know, doesn't want to reveal their address. They only want to have a list of places they operate in. They can do that. 
or if they have a hybrid model where they have like a store, you know, plus they will come to your, your house uh, for services, you can, you can list both. So there is a lot of optionality there. Um, next here, uh, you, can, you can specify the set of places. Um, when you specify those places, uh, that will you know, directly help in search. So if someone searches for a handyman in a zip code or a handyman in a city, if you have that place specified, Google can return your business. Um, what they actually do is they construct a service area out of the places that you specify. Um, so you can see that on maps. So where this person will, will come and help out. Now, let's talk about service area places for a bit. So you can specify uh, up to 20 different places. And again, Google will construct the area out of those places. Um, and what you need, to, you need to specify is basically a place type and the place itself. So a place type is like a geographical area. So it could be a postal code, a city, a region, a neighborhood. Uh, there's a bunch of different options here. Um, and then you need to specify the actual place itself. So let's say you chose zip code, you might choose you know, 10,001. If you chose a city, you might say New York City, for example. Um, so you specify that list to Google. Uh, and again, they'll build that area for you uh, and help you appear uh, on maps. And the last one to go through here uh, is the difference between a business description uh, and an editorial summary. So a business description uh, is, is sort of this from the business section. Um, these can be edited by businesses. So uh, if you provide this, uh, it will actually appear on a knowledge card um, in the, from the business section. Now this is contrasted with uh, an editorial summary. Um, businesses cannot edit these. So these actually come from Google uh, Google generates these using a combination of people and AI, um, and, and these are the different, uh, th these are basically on your listing, uh, whether, you, whether you like it or not. So again, you can control the business description, but you cannot control the editorial summary. Um, if you think the editorial summary is factually inaccurate, so they say something about your business that just isn't true, um, there might be grounds for escalation to Google to get it changed. Uh, but otherwise, you're, you're sort of stuck with, with, with what Google gave you, uh, and you should focus on editing that business description. That's a great way to talk about your business. All right, I'm going to pass it back over to Trent, uh, and you can talk about where to learn more. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, certainly a lot of great information. If you want to learn more, uh, make sure you check out the Yex Hitchhiker community. Um, we'll be sharing a lot more content like this. You'll, of course, have the opportunity um, to test your knowledge with certain quizzes and, you know, in platform types of challenges, um, you know, provide a way to earn different listings badges and become an expert in the listing space um, and can even, you know, sort of showcase your expertise um, by sharing that amongst your different colleagues and friends. So certainly can't recommend Hitchhikers enough. Go ahead and check out the site and go ahead and, and expand the, uh, our community of search experts. So I think we had a few questions as well um, that we can go ahead and get to here. Um, Calvin, I'm not sure if you're able to see them, but I can probably read off a few that have come through. Yeah, um, I, I, I can see them, so I can, I can start running through these here. So uh, the first question we have, um, let's say that you have several business listings. Um, is it okay to use the same business description or is it better for each one to be unique? Um, so what I would say in this case is um, it's okay to use the same description for each of them, um, but uh, it's a little bit better to have them be unique if you can. So if you can include unique information about the business, you know, it could be something about, uh, you know, what they offer or where they're located to help them help someone find it, uh, or maybe a bit of history about that location. Um, those are the sorts of things that make that content unique. Um, so again, it's fine if you only have, you know, one corporate approved tagline, uh, that, that, that would be okay. Um, but having that unique local content uh, is, is always a little bit better. Um, the next one we have here, uh, is about any recent updates to Google local posts. So are they still valuable? Um, is it a good signal to Google that your business is active? Um, yes. So the, the recent updates that Google has done surrounding local posts uh, are twofold. So first, um, local posts were not allowed for chain businesses, um, but Google actually unlocked those restrictions. So if you operate you know, a, a larger, more of an enterprise brand, um, you can local post uh, via the API now. So if you want to post in bulk uh, across your locations, that is allowed. And then also there was a restriction where uh, hotel properties on Google could not use posts. 
um, but that was also unlocked as well. Uh, so now those uh, types of locations can post. Um, and so in, in, in terms of the uh, value to your listings, um, yes, posting is a great way to show your business is active. Um, you'd be surprised how many people actually view these posts. You know, you can see like uh, people clicking on them for CTAs. Um, so it is a pretty valuable signal and we definitely recommend doing it. Um, the next here is a question about, um, you know, reserve with Google uh, for a healthcare provider. Like, is there a specific button type for making appointments? So um, I'm not sure if Reserve with Google works for healthcare specifically yet. Um, I think that might be something they're thinking about. Um, so I, I, would, I would not be surprised if that appears in the near future. Um, for that one, there will probably be uh, a different uh, button text there. Or, you know, it, it won't say Reserve a Table, of course. It will say something like, you know, book an appointment or uh, other language that makes sense. So Google will certainly figure that out. Um, so I would look out for that one uh, to be potentially coming soon uh, on the re reserve with Google for healthcare piece. Um, generally, Google launches things for healthcare uh, after other verticals, just because uh, there's a bit more risk there to, to think about. Um, the next one here is, does Google plan to keep fields um, for healthcare related to COVID-19 info and testing sites for the foreseeable future? Um, as of now, yes, uh, we've received no indication from Google um, that they're going to stop taking data from us about uh, COVID-19 info or, or testing site info. Um, so continue to keep that data up to date uh, and provide it to us or Google. Um, you know, COVID is, is, is still happening, unfortunately. So uh, until that changes, um, Google uh, will take that data and they'll want to make sure that their maps um, are as accurate as possible. All right, we have another question here. Um, so what would be the best practices for updating a business that's going to be acquired? Um, should we create them as new locations um, or, or just take them over? Um, so again, it's, it's gonna depend. depend. Um, if, this is, if the business is going to be you know, staying in the same place and operating largely as it was before, so maybe it's the same staff, you know, it's the same signage and that sort of thing, um, then you might want to keep the listing that you already have and just update, you know, key fields. Um, but if you're actually going through, you know, a full rebrand where all that review content, all that photo content uh, is no longer relevant, um, then it would be safer to make a new listing in that place because you get that opportunity to, to reset your rating. Um, so it's sort of up to you in that case, which one makes the most sense. Uh, and again, check out that, that blog post on Hitchhiker. Um, we'll make sure that gets sent out. Uh, that can help you make that decision. Uh, between the, the two pieces here. Great, it looks like those are all the questions we have uh, we so a, far. I think we had a few questions in the chat as well. So there were a few um, different places there. Um, I can kind of read off a few quickly if you wanna. Sure, um, yeah, let's go through those. All right, so there's one, will, uh, will place action be a field in the knowledge graph? Uh, yes, so we, we will repurpose an existing field um, for the uh, pickup URL, and then uh, we will have a new field coming soon for the order URL. Um, and we're also going to have some place actions from over more on the booking side too. Um, it won't be with Reserve with Google, um, but it will be additional place actions. So yes, there will be new fields coming soon for this. So. Um, also a question relating to call history. So will the insights be broken down um, separately for each location for businesses that have more than one location? Yes, this is a great question. Uh, they will be. So uh, applicable dimensions for the, the call data will be um, you know, by, by day or by time of day, um, if the, the call was answered or not, but then also it will be broken down by location. So you can see you know, business A is picking up the phone, but business B is not. Uh, that will be, uh, you'll be able to do that. Awesome. I think we got one more here and this one maybe speak to a little bit, um, Calvin, but it's asking him about the, um, the, how the, uh, how reviews sort of um, help you rank higher in search, whether it's the quantity or quality of the reviews that help you um, rank better, which one sends a stronger signal to Google. We can even probably talk about recency of reviews as well on that. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so there's, th there's three factors here. There's quantity, quality, and, and recency. Um, they are all important um, and they're important in different ways. So the, uh, 
for, for, the, for the quality piece. So this would be your star rating. Um, this is important for businesses or for, or for users just making that snap decision of, you know, uh, is, is this like a highly rated business? Um, it could also help uh, impact different searches. Like if I search for best pizza near me, um, Google might pre-filter uh, a local pack to only businesses that have a higher than a four star rating. Um, so rating can be really important for those types of searches. Now, the quantity piece is important for reinforcing that rating. Uh, if you have a five-star rating, but only one review, no one really trusts it. If you have a five-star rating, but you have a hundred reviews, th th there's way more trust there. Um, so those two pieces kind of go together. Uh, you want to make sure you also have the quantity. And then finally, recency. Um, again, this is more of a trust piece. Uh, if you have you know, a five-star rating, but your last review was two years ago, people have no idea how your business operates today. Um, so again, to, to bolster that, uh, quality score. You want to make sure that you're consistently getting uh, new reviews. Um, it's also a signal to Google that this business is, act, is active and open. Looks like we have a few more questions in, in the Q&A here. Uh, so one is, so regarding business hours, um, what is the best practice for locations that are on call 24 hours but they're only open as a sort of a storefront from eight to five. So how do we best inform visitors of this? So this one's a little bit tricky. Um, Google did actually add uh, a few additional hours types recently. Um, so it could be a way to indicate that, you know, maybe your branch is open at this time, but you know, your ATM is open at another time, or maybe you only have breakfast during these hours or more of a COVID thing, you know, senior hours, for example. I don't think they specifically have on-call hours, um, but that might be a, a type of the ad in the future. Um, another way to, to get around this would be to use uh, the business description field um, or the local posting field of saying, you know, we're on call 24 hours, just having that appear as text uh, on the listing could help uh, and supplement that standard hours of, of eight to five. <clears throat> Uh, and the last question here, um, does Google have an option to uh, record phone calls? Um, at this time, no, that is, that sounds like a, um, you know, like a, like a PII nightmare. Um, so I, I, don't, I wouldn't guess that Google would have that option uh, anytime soon. It looks like we covered all of the questions in the Q&A in the chat. Um, if there's any last minute questions, throw them in there. Uh, otherwise, I think Trent, you can go ahead and close this out. Let me, we'll see if any others trickle in here, but I guess we'll take that as a no. Well, great questions. Hopefully you all enjoyed the content, found everything super helpful. Um, where can we find part one? Um, we will follow up um, with a recording of not only this uh, webinar, but we will include the uh, recording of the part one webinar that was um, um, that we hosted February 23rd. So a few months back, um, we'll be able to share that with all of you. But again, wanted to say thank you. And we really appreciate all the questions and taking the time to join us today. So we look forward to sharing more content around um, listings and best practices in the future. So thanks again, and we'll, uh, um, we'll enjoy the rest of our week.